Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's discuss now a new play by uh, Girish Karnad called Agni Mattu Male or The Fire and the Rain, 1994, uh, which is a meta theatrical play about love, violence, and sacrifice for the community. It was written in Kannada but was immediately rendered into English for a workshop for actors um, at the Guthri. Uh, the play has been performed uh, in Hindi and English as well and has also been made into a Hindi movie. But liberties have been taken, as uh, the uh, theatre scholar Aparna Dharwadkar recounts in the introduction to the, uh, the second volume of uh, Girish Karna's collected plays, where she recounts they were, uh, that the uh, playwrights, um, I mean the directors, took uh, liberties with the play and the script uh, when they remade the, the play into um, Hindi uh, and English and also made a movie out of it, much to the uh, disapproval of Girish Karna. Uh, the play itself takes the form of a play within a play, which is why uh, uh, it's, it's a meta-theatrical play where performance itself becomes uh, a theme uh, in the play. Right? So the inner play, the play within the play, uh, thematizes the outer frame play uh, and uh, they both, in some sense, the distinction between reality, the outside play, the frame play, reality, and uh, the, the life, the world of the inner play uh, gets blurred and collapses by the end of the uh, play. So there's a complete uh, blurring of uh, the very distinction between reality and fiction, uh, between uh, representation and, and the object being represented. Right. Uh, and the outer play which frames the inner play is a modern adaptation of the tale of Yavakri. So Girish Karna takes, uh, you know, the, as the raw material of his play, uh, the story or the tale of Yavakri which is taken from the Vana, Vana Parva of the Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata, uh, Yavakri is the son of the sage Bharadvaja, uh, who acquires knowledge of the Vedas from Indra after years of penance. He uses uh, this knowledge that is acquired uh, from Indra of the Vedas to molest the doctrine law of the sage Raibya, whom he resents and who in turn creates a demon and a spirit in the form of his daughter-in-law to kill, to kill Yavakri. But Bharadvaja curses Raibhya that he will be killed by his own son and thus Raibhya is killed by his son Paravasu who mistakes his father who is wearing deer skin for a deer. Paravasu then falsely accuses his brother Aravasu for killing their father and excludes him from the fire sacrifice that they are both conducting and officiating and where Paravasu is the chief priest. Uh, Aravasu begins his own penance by praying to the sun god who brings back, who, who grants him his boon that Yavakri, Bharadvaja and Raibhya be brought back to life. In Karnad's modern rendition of the tale, Yavakri and Vishakha, Raibhya's daughter-in-law, are lovers both before and after her marriage to Paravasu. Her own marriage is loveless uh, because her husband after gratifying his desire for, for her in the first year of their marriage, uh, abandons her in Rabia's care to participate in the fire sacrifice that would promise him greater power. Uh, so, of course, the, the, fire, the sacrifice is being uh, conducted to actually pray for rains because the land has not, the parched land has not seen rains for years and uh, many people are dying, you know, are, are re relocating, uh, fleeing because of the, of the famine and the drought. Uh, Vishakha brings about Yavakri's death uh, precisely out of her own desire to keep him alive because uh, when uh, Yavakri decides to actually um, <coughs> uh, seek uh, uh, revenge against uh, Raibhya because he resents Raibhya for having been made the, ch the, the chief uh, priest and now he's uh, unlike his father who did not receive any recognition or validation. So he wants to actually avenge his father's insult. And so he decides to try and uh, kill uh, uh, Raibhya. But Vishakha then brings about Yavakri's own death uh, uh, 
precisely because of her desire to keep him alive. So there's a cruel irony to this whole situation where uh, where um, uh, Raibia has created this uh, Brahma Rakshas, this demon uh, that will uh, that will kill uh, Yavakri, and Vishaka, who is in love with Yavakri, despite the fact that she's been married to her husband Paravasa for ten years, uh, uh, tries her best to uh, keep uh, Yavakri alive. And uh, although Yavakri tells Vishaka that nothing can uh, uh, can kill him because he has uh, a jug full of sacred water and even a drop of that water is enough to actually uh, you know numb the demon uh, completely freeze him so that he cannot kill him uh, vishaka uh, does not uh, trust or have any faith in his power and she ends up emptying the entire jug of water and there's not a drop of water left and then she she uh, pleads uh, yavakri to go and take refuge in his father's hermitage, which is the only place where he'll, he can be safe from the demon. But of course, as, uh, as uh, uh, tragedy would have it, he is rushing towards his father's hermitage when uh, Andaka, the blind Shudra man in the play, the Shudra character who's blind in the, in the play, is unable to recognize uh, Yavakri's footsteps uh, and uh, you know ca catches hold of him as he is guarding uh, Yavakri's uh, father's hermitage, and in the meanwhile, the demon, the Brahma Rakshas, uh, overtakes Yavakri and impales him with a spear. So he is killed. Uh, Paravasu, in turn, kills uh, his father deliberately. Unlike the tale in the Mahabharata, where he accidentally kills his father, uh, mistaking him for a deer. Here, Paravasu hates his father, resents his father, and he kills his father deliberately out of hatred. And finally, ch himself chooses death uh, at the Yagnya to expiate himself to expiate himself in the act of patricide. Uh, the Rakshasa returns to the spirit world as he is uh, released from the bondage of life and death with uh, Aravasu's compassion and forgiveness. And, in, and, and with Aravasu's intervention, he is freed of the bondage of life and death. There's also a parallel story that Karna develops in the play, uh, which is the love affair between Aravasu and Nittilai, a tribal woman. While the other male char characters of the play, uh, Raibhya, Paravasu, and Yav uh, Yavakri, uh, represent the power of, uh, of and violence of ascetic Brahmanism, uh, Aravasu is caught in between the world of the Brahman and the world of the non-Brahman of the Shudra, uh, between the sacred and the profane, the sacred world of, of, of Vedic Brahmanism, and uh, the profane world of the non-Brahman, of the tribal, of the Shudra. Uh, and uh, the, the opposition between the, Bra the world of the Brahmin and the world of the Shudra uh, is mapped on to the opposition between the mind and the body, uh, between the life of discipline and, and ritual sacrifice and emotion. Right? Um, while, uh, so therefore, you know, Brahmins are equated with uh, this ruthless greed for power and violence and uh, the Shudra is associated with, uh, with compassion, uh, you know, compassion and love for humanity. While Raibhya and Yavakri and Paravasu have lost the legitimacy of their power through their acts of violence uh, and killing, Aravasu has a redemptive function to play in the, uh, to, uh, in the play, uh, where he works for the greater good of his community, even at the cost of, of, of losing Nithilai. Uh, Nithilai pays uh, f with her life uh, while she's trying to rescue Aravasu from uh, the, the sacrifice. Um, and uh, so she loses her, she loses, he loses her. And uh, Vishaka herself is chastised uh, in the play for, uh, but not punished for transgressing the boundaries of female chastity because she has an affair with, um, she continues to have, to, her, to have an affair with Yavakri even after she's married. And uh, Nithilai loses her life for choosing Aravasu over her husband. Uh, so Nithilai is actually married off to her tribal, uh, a man from her own tribe. Um, because uh, Aravasu loses his opportunity to get married to her because he is busy trying to, uh, he is stuck, uh, you know, carrying out the final rites for Yavakri after he is killed. And so he loses the opportunity to actually uh, arrive on time at the tribal's uh, council of elders meeting where he was supposed to marry uh, Nithilai. Uh, the distinction uh, between the play and the play within the play is blurred and collapsed by the end when Paravasu pollutes the sacrificial area with his act of patricide. And Aravasu, who assumes the role of Vritri, which is, uh, which is the, the, the half demonic son of Brahma. Brahma has uh, three sons. Uh, one is uh, Indra, 
one is uh, who the divine son one is uh, vishwarupa who is uh, his uh, son through a mortal woman and vritri is brahma's son with uh, that he had with uh, a, a demoness right so uh, aravasu plays the role of vritri in the play within the play and he wears a mask uh, in the in the play to uh, in the in the play to play the role of vritri but ends up bringing the mask to life Uh, and ends up destroying the sacrificial altar and killing Parvasu. Right, so the mask comes to life, and there's there's no no there's no longer a distinction between uh, fiction and reality between the world of the play outside the play and the play within the play. Nitalai Lu pays uh, f- uh, with her own life uh, because she cannot stop herself from rescuing Aravasu from the destruction of the Agnya, and finally Aravasu sacrifices his own happiness with Nitalai for the sake of the Brahma Rakshas's release from life and death. So now let us just look at uh, the um, the details of the play. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the whole idea of performance is thematized in the play. Uh, it becomes a chief theme of the play, uh, which uh, in some sense is also an expression of the sacred. It's one of the expressions of the sacred is performance itself, because it uh, it legitimizes the divine origins of drama and theatre from um, Bharata's Nati Shastra onwards. and it also acknowledges and validates the uh, the lower caste identity of the actor uh, in the hierarchy of caste so the actor is considered to be a lower caste person simply also by virtue of acting because when aravasu decides to take on the life of an actor decides to become an actor uh, his brother paravasu forbids him from um, Uh, entering the sacrificial uh, arena because he is he has polluted uh, his own uh, brahmanical identity and he's polluted the uh, his community by becoming an actor so if you look at the uh, the opening stage directions of the play they're quite elaborate uh, it says that it has not rained adequately for nearly 10 years this is the prologue and the prologue uh, and the epilogue uh, frame the inner play right so you have a prologue which is uh, which which uh, which is situated at that point in time when uh, aravasu is on the verge of acting uh, in uh, the play within the play as vritri and he is looking out he is searching for nitale who cannot be found in the audience the play also ends with an epilogue where uh, uh, you know the the yagna has been destroyed and towards the end uh, you know there is a complete collapse between the play and the play within the play So in in the initial uh, prologue the description of the stage directions are like this so there has been a uh, a uh, uh, a drought for nearly 10 years which has caused famine and uh, there there has been a, a seven year long fire sacrifice to the lord indra uh, who is the god of rains uh, prop- uh, to propitiate him in order to uh, enable uh, rains uh, in in a land that has been parched with uh, years of drought fire burns in the center of step like brick altars There are several such altars at at all of which priests are offering oblations to the fire while singing the prescribed hymns in unison. The priests are all dressed in long flowing seamless pieces of cloth and wear sacred threads. The king who is the host is similarly dressed but has his head covered. Paravasu is the conducting priest. He will be called the chief priest since he is the most important of them all. It is his responsibility to see that there are no errors either of omission or of commission. in the performance of the sacrifice he is about 28 it is an impressive panorama the brahma rakshasa a brahman soul trapped in the limbo between de- death and rebirth is moving around at the sacrificial precincts though no human eye can see him so the brahma rakshasa already exists he is a, a, a brahman soul that's been trapped between uh, death and rebirth and is constantly hovering uh, around the uh, sacrificial uh, area the afternoon session is over the priests begin to disperse a courtier enters with the actor manager the latter is made to stand at a distance from the fire sacrifice since as an actor he is considered low born the courtier rushes into the protected enclosure of the fire sacrifice and talks to the king the priests surround them there's a heated discussion and they're discussing the possibility of having a play to which the king is quite shocked and will not allow it and uh, when they discover that uh, aravasu is going to play the uh, a role in the in the in the play then uh, they all all the brahmins actually all the priests are quite shocked that a brahmin is going to be acting so um the actor manager says to the brahmins that sirs as is well known to you brahma the lord of all creation extracted the requisite elements from the four vedas and combined them into a fifth veda and thus gave birth to the art of drama 
So of course, this is the validation, the acknowledgement of Brahma as the fifth Veda. The, it, it's, it's an acknowledgement of the divine origins of, of Brahma. He handed it over to his son, Lord Indra, the god of the skies. Lord Indra in turn passed on the art to Bharata, a human being, for the gods cannot indulge in pretense. So if Indra is to be pleased and bring to an end this long drought which ravages our land, a fire sacrifice is not enough. A play has to be performed along with it. If we offer him entertainment in addition to the oblations, the God may grant us the rains we are praying for. Right? So this need to enact, to perform along with a fire sacrifice to propitiate the God of rains, Indra. And of course the courtier is very clear that uh, Aravas who should not be uh, admitted into the sacrificial arena because he is also going to be acting in the play, which is the role of a lower caste person. And of course, the uh, Aravasu sends a message with the actor manager, which says, a message from a brother, dear elder brother, this is a message from Ara Aravasu to his older brother Paravasu, which says, the sons of Bharata were the first actors in the history of theatre. They were Brahmins, but lost their caste because of their profession. A, ca a curse plunged them into disrepute and dis disgrace. If one values one's high birth, one should not touch this profession. And I accepted this, but today I am a criminal. I have killed my father, a normal Brahmin. I already stand tarnished. I may now become an actor. This follows from your own words, so please do not bar the way now. Right? So here, we must remember that uh, Aravasu um, you know, performs the function of redeeming uh, the sin that his brother Paravasu uh, committed of killing their father. Right? So he, he performs the, uh, the expiatory rites of um, redeeming his, uh, his uh, father's death at his brother's hands. And he uses this opportunity to actually um, uh, you know, uh, seek uh, the possibility of freedom. Uh, of freedom from caste, freedom from Brahmanical uh, Hinduism, from caste and uh, the freedom to actually marry uh, the woman he loves, uh, which is Nithilai, a tribal girl. So by embracing uh, a stigma which of, of patricide, of killing, uh, which he does not commit himself, Aravasu uh, then gains the freedom of acting, of performing, of, uh, of, of propitiating uh, the Lord Indra and of also redeeming uh, his, father, his brother's uh, uh, sin of patricide and not of course to mention also the fact that he can now he hopes that he will be able to live happily with Nithile but as the play is about to begin uh, Aravasu is hoping that Nithile is in the audience watching the play right? so he's happy when the courtier ma when, the, when the courtier and actor manager tell Aravasu that Paravasu has given him permission to act in the play he says he's agreed Nithile he tells himself uh, he'll be there to watch the play but where are you why aren't you here Nithilai, Nithilai, I'm going to act on stage. I hope you're watching. Please, please watch. The play is about to begin. Yes, after all these years, it's going to happen. But you know, and brother knows, and I know that this isn't the real thing. This is a fiction borrowed from the myths. The real play began somewhere else. A month ago. A month? Was it really that recent? It seems ages and ages of darkness ago. You and I were going to get married begin a new life and I had to meet the elders of your tribe. Right? So there's a flashback at this point which goes back to the point when uh, they were in love and um, Aravasu was going to meet the, the tribal council of elders to ask Nithile uh, for a hand in marriage. And Nithile in Act 1 uh, tells Aravasu that uh, she's hopeful that uh, the elders of her tribe will agree to the marriage because uh, it's not often as she says that they get a Brahmin groom. Right. So they may actually think it's a matter of honor to get their daughter married to a Brahmin groom. And Aravasu says that he is now free to, uh, as he says, I'm about to jettison my caste, my people, my whole heritage for you. Right. So uh, Nithile, of course, is initially modest and she does not wish, wish to be uh, touched by a man before the marriage. And so she says, I cannot be touched by you. And Aravasu says, I'm, I'm actually giving up, renouncing my entire caste, my people, my whole heritage for you. Can't, my, can't you forget a minor custom for my sake? And Nithila says, this is the only custom that's actually worth observing because I actually retain my, my uh, modesty, my reputation, uh, so that uh, nothing, uh, there can be no mishap 
before our man. Arvasu says, all these days I couldn't touch you because Brahmins don't touch other castes. Now you, can't, now you can't touch me because among hunters, girls don't touch their betrothed. Are you sure someone won't think of something else once we're married? Then later on, Aravasu again expresses his desire for uh, sheer happiness and joy to be with Nithile. He has none of the, uh, the ambitions, uh, the spiritual ascetic ambitions that his brother and father and Yavakri have, his cousin Yavakri has. He says, I'll never be learned like father or uncle. I shan't ever conduct the royal sacrifice like Paravasu or perform penance like cousin Yavakri. All I want is to dance and sing and act and be with Nithile. It doesn't matter a flake of cow dung, cow dung to my father whether I'm alive or dead. My sister-in-law lives wrapped up in a world of her own that leaves only my brother. Right? So she's, he's not concerned with these temporal ambitions uh, of power and he's not concerned with the sacrifice. So he's free to do what he likes. And Andaka, who is the blind, the blind uh, Shudra in the play, uh, asks him what would happen if uh, Paravasu, his brother, forbids the marriage. And he says, Aravasu says, I'll tell him, I can't give up Nitile. She's my life. I can't live without her. I'd rather be an, out, an outcast. Right? So he's willing to actually sacrifice his, um, uh, his caste community uh, for his love for Nitile. And Nitile, of course, is very concerned, uh, hoping that uh, sh they will get married because marriage is the only guarantee that she and her tribal community has that uh, she will not be misled and betrayed uh, by uh, a man who was willing to marry her uh, before the marriage. Right? Then uh, through Andaka, uh, Nithile and uh, Aravasu uh, learn of Yavakri's uh, penance, that Yavakri performs uh, these uh, self-mortifications and penance for years to win the favor of Indra. Ten years, Andaka says, ten years of rigorous penance and still Lord Indra would not oblige. Finally, Yavakri stood in the middle of a circle of fire and started offering his limbs to the fire. First his fingers, then his eyes, then his entrails, his tongue, and at last his heart. That's when the god appeared to him, restored him limbs, and granted him the boon. Andakas later on says, on 115, Every Brahmin on the face of this earth wants to gain spiritual powers, but few succeed. In my lifetime, I have known only two who did. Your uncle, as in referring to uh, Ar Ar Aravasu's uncle, your uncle and your father Aravasu, but they got their knowledge from human gurus by diligent study. Yavakri has gone beyond even them. He received his knowledge from the gods, direct. Your uncle was sure he would fail. How he tried to dissuade the boy from taking on this ordeal. But I said to him, Master, let him go to the jungle. You don't know your son, I do. I brought him up on this lap of mine. He will succeed in anything he tries. You mark my words. So Andaka is uh, raised uh, um, Yavakri from the time he was a child. And he is cons convinced that Yavakri is determined to win uh, greater powers uh, and to uh, be blessed the land with rain through his, uh, his uh, harsh, uh, severe austerities and penance uh, to win uh, Lord Indra's favor. And now he has come back. So unlike yeah, Arvasu's father and, uh, and uncle, who won their uh, spiritual power through, who gained the spiritual power through uh, human gurus, Yavakri uh, wins it uh, through the sheer determination and arrogance of, uh, of, uh, of his penance, of his tapasya, uh, to actually acquire uh, power, spiritual power from uh, Indra himself. And Nithile is one of those characters uh, embodying the, the, the profane non-Brahmanical world of uh, the tribes, the tribal world of the tribes, of the Shudras, who constantly questions the uh, ritual discipline uh, and form of, uh, of ascetic Brahmanism. Uh, she says, uh, you know, their fire sacrifices are conducted in covered enclosures. They mortify themselves in the dark of the jungle. Even their gods appear so secretly. Why? What are they afraid of? Look at my people. Everything is done in public view here. The priest announces that he'll invoke the deity at such and such a time on such and such a day. And then there, right in front of the whole tribe, he gets possessed. And the spirit answers your questions. You can feel it come and go. You know it's there, not mere hearsay. So here in the tribal community, you have a man who gets possessed, who becomes the conduit, the medium through which uh, the earthly world communicates with the spirit world. 
unlike the world of Vedic Brahmanism, where everything happens as a secret ritual that is only uh, privy uh, to by uh, Brahmins. Uh, you have a fire sacrifice that happens in private within the presence in the front in the presence of, of the king and the Brahmins. So this is the contrast that she draws between the two worlds, the difference, uh, the com utter difference between the world of the Brahmin and the world of the tribe, of the tribal. Nithila says, my point is, since Lord Indra appeared to Yavakri, and Indra is their god of rains, why didn't Yavakri ask for a couple of good showers? You should see the region around our village, parched. Every, womb, every morning, women with babes on the hips, shrunken children, shriveled old men, and women gather in front of my father's house. For the gruel he distributes, no young people, they have all disappeared. And father says all the land needs is a couple of heavy downpours. That will revive the earth. Not too much to ask of a god, is it? So, so she, she's very practical. She says, what, is, what, what stopped Evakri from asking Indra for uh, rains so that uh, they can uh, you know, overcome the famine and the drought that has ravaged the land for a decade? So uh, she is more interested in actually, uh, uh, you know, using uh, divine uh, divinity, God, uh, and, and divine power to, uh, you know, um, uh, save her people from starvation and death. But Andaka says, half agreeing, that uh, these divine powers uh, should not be used to solve day-to-day -day problems. They are meant to lead to inner knowledge. Right? So there's obviously a, a, a distinction being made between uh, inner knowledge, inner spiritual knowledge, self-knowledge, absolute infinite knowledge, and a power that's required to actually help humanity. Right? So you have the, the sacred, the divine, the ritual, uh, and, uh, and human uh, individual ambition uh, opposed to uh, power that can be used, uh, divine power, uh, uh, the power of humanity uh, that can be used to, to secure uh, humanity's own welfare. Mithile later on says, actually I want to ask Yavakri two questions. Can he make it rain? And then, can he tell when he's going to die? Just two. What is the point of any knowledge if you can't save dying children and if you can't predict your own moment of death? Right? So she's the voice of uh, secular humanism which is completely crushed and killed by the end of the play. And of course, Yavakri uh, makes a, a, an appearance later on in another part of the stage, which is the Hermitage, Hermitage of Raibhya, the father of Aravasu. Vishaka is about 26, but she does not look like she is, uh, she is happy. I mean, she, is, she looks completely uh, sullen and haggard, is, is the description. She was once an attractive woman, but now she is trapped in a loveless marriage. Her husband has long left her to be the chief priest of the fire sacrifice, and she's in her father-in-law Raibhya's care. And she just spends her day uh, through the daily rituals of uh, you know, collecting water in a pot when Yavakri appears, and she is quite surprised and shocked to see him after so many years. And uh, he makes advances at her, and she's unable to uh, stop him. Uh, she does feel secretly uh, uh, pleased and happy to see him after so many years. And Yavakri doesn't seem to have changed at all from uh, his 10 years of penance. He, in his pursuit of universal knowledge, he is still uh, susceptible to his own lust for Vishaka. Again, like Nithilai, Vishaka is another woman in the play who questions the hypocrisy of uh, Brahminical uh, discipline and uh, asceticism. Uh, because these men have obviously not been able to completely sublimate their desires, their, their greed uh, into, into asceticism, into penance, uh, because they're still uh, the same people. They're still overcome by, by lust and uh, greed for power. Yavakri says, for a start, it's not as easy as you think to actually get universal knowledge from the God. It's not just that, it's not just a question of performing austerities uh, in the name of a God and then winning universal knowledge. It's much harder than that. So he describes his arduous life in the forest. He says, life in the jungle is sheer hell. Flies, giant ants, beetles, pests, leeches, and attacking at the suspicion of moisture, vipers lurking in bowels of dust, the relentless heat, not demons but mosquitoes to torture you. One would expect the appearance of a god to be a shattering experience, concrete, indubitable, almost physical. But though I think Indra came to be several times, I was never certain. Then the first time he appeared, he said, No, Yavakri, you can't master knowledge through austerities. It must come with experience. Knowledge is time, it is space. You must move through these dimensions. I said, No, I must have it. Grant me all knowledge. He laughed and said, you're being silly. That's it. 
common dialogue, not very profound. And when the god disappeared, nothing was left behind to prove he had never been there. I looked around. The same old black scorpion, the same horned chameleon, the shower of birch around me. So it was all a hallucination caused by something I'd eaten that morning? Or was it fever working on my brain? So I go on, another year, perhaps two. Then the god comes again. Why are you being so stubborn? He chides. You can't cross a full stream on a bridge of sand, and so on. So he is, uh, Yavakri is relentless uh, in his pursuit for greater power from Indra, right? And Indra says that the only way you can actually gain power is through experience. You're not a god, you're a human being. But uh, Yavakri it does not refuses to listen, right? He's determined to win his, uh, his, his boon. But Vishaka is in complete contrast to uh, Yavakri because she is only concerned with the fact that she, like the Shudra, like the tribal, is outside the realm of uh, uh, Brahmanical masculinity because she has spent her life abandoned, neglected. She has lost her youth, her desirability. She seems to have even lost her, live to, her, her will to live. And she's not concerned with uh, these male uh, Brahminical male ambitions of power. And she also recounts how after the first year of marriage, when uh, Paravasu uh, uh, gratified her, his, I mean, sought sensual gratification from Vishaka, and then abandons her in his father's care to become the chief priest of the, of the fire sacrifice to the rain god, um, she, Vishaka tells, uh, tells uh, Yavakri about how after uh, the f first year of marriage, um, Paravasu tells her, that on the first day of the second year of the marriage, he said, enough of that. We now start on our search. And then it wasn't that I was not happy. The question of happiness receded into the background. So for Vishakha, happiness is just living, being happy with the husband. But for the husband, he wants to seek absolute knowledge, right? Uh, he used my body and his own body like an experimenter, an explorer, as instruments in a search. Search for what? I never knew. But I knew he knew. Nothing was too shameful, too, de de too degrading, even too painful. Shame died in me, and I yielded. I let my body be turned inside out as he did his own. I had a sense he was leading me on to something. Mystical, spiritual, we never talked. Then one day, he received the invitation from the king to be the chief priest of the fire sacrifice, and he left. The site of the fire sacrifice is only a couple of hours away from here. But in all these seven years, he hasn't come back. So he's only interested in, uh, in pursuing, uh, in furthering his own uh, Brahminical power while, uh, Yavak, while uh, Vishakha uh, has been left abandoned uh, and trapped in a loveless marriage. And so she blames both Yavakri and, uh, on, and um, uh, Paravasu of being these typical uh, Brahmin men who are only interested in their own selfish uh, ends. And later on, uh, Yavakri actually meets uh, Nitile as uh, she's talking to Aravasu. Uh, in fact, later on, Aravasu and Nitile almost discover uh, the affair that Yavakri is having with Vishakha as they are, uh, as they are secretly uh, talking to each other along the banks of a, of a river when uh, Aravasu walks in on, upon them. But uh, at the last moment, uh, Vishakha escapes. Uh, but her clothes are torn and she's completely uh, dirty with, uh, with mud and filth and, and slush on her back. And uh, she sees, uh, he, uh, he sees Yavakri pursuing her. And on the way, uh, Yavakri uh, meets, sees Nitile and, uh, and contemptuously curses her. Uh, when Nitile, he gets to know, he obviously knows through his divine knowledge that uh, she wants to know when he will die. And uh, so he says that, uh, I don't know when I'll die, but I promise you this, you'll be dead within a month, right? So Yavakri actually uh, foretells uh, Nitile's death. Uh, later on, uh, Aravasu and, uh, does not tell uh, Raibhya, his father, about the affair between Yavakri and, uh, and, uh, and Vishaka, although he discovers it. He learns, uh, somehow he, he uh, rests the secret out, out of Aravasu and he realizes that there's an affair going on between the two. And he's very disgusted with his daughter-in-law and calls her a whore for uh, having an affair with uh, another man. But uh, he falls, uh, stops short of cursing her. And he decides that um, uh, it's Paravasu's responsibility to actually take care of, uh, discipline his wife. So Vishaka is not punished, but she's chastised for her 
uh, sexual transgression. Uh, and later on, uh, Raipe decides to actually avenge uh, the insult to his family, to his reputation by creating a Brahma Rakshas. Uh, so he even he invokes a Brahma Rakshas and he tells uh, the Rakshas to uh, to actually uh, kill uh, Yavakri. Right? He says Vishakha, he tells his daughter-in-law Vishakha, uh, go and tell your lover, I accept his challenge. I shall invoke the Kritya and send a Brahma Rakshasa, a demon soul after him. Let Yavakri save himself. He need only go and hide in his father's hermitage. I love my brother and will not desecrate his altar. Let Yavakri cower in there like a dog. If he steps out, he'll be dead. And so the only place where Yav Yavakri can be free is at his father's hermitage. And his father is Raibya's brother. So since Raibya actually respects his brother and uh, the sanctity of his hermitage, that's the only space where Yavakri can be uh, safe. And he says that uh, if Yavakri can keep himself alive for 24 hours, he will accept uh, defeat and enter the fire. So Vishaka is intent on uh, saving Yavakri's life and they go in search of him. And the, uh, Arvas was unable to find him, but Vishaka sees him, uh, for, discovers him, uh, you know, murmuring incantations, sitting cross-legged with his uh, Kamandulu, his uh, water jug in front of him. Vishaka runs in panting and uh, uh, while Yavakri continues meditating. And uh, he calls, she calls out to Yavakri who opens his eyes and acknowledges Vishaka's presence. And Vishaka tells him that uh, her father-in-law has invoked the Kritya spell to engage his, his full powers. And that he has, um, he has, uh, you, he has uh, made use of a, he has created a Brahma Rakshas to actually kill Yavakri. And Yavakri is not scared. He's not daunted because he has his uh, magical water in his jug. And he is, uh, he is convinced that a, a drop of this water will render the demon powerless. But Vishaka is not convinced and she ends up pouring uh, the water uh, into the earth. And uh, Yavakri is uh, betrayed and then he, is, he starts panicking and he rushes uh, towards his father's hermitage. Because that's the only space where he can be safe. So this is of course uh, a, an, an, a tragic, ironic twist in Karnad's rendition of the original tale, where Vishaka can only uh, uh, keep, uh, uh, he, uh, keep Yavakri alive by uh, enabling his death. So Yavakri rushes, but then uh, Andaka, who has been placed uh, by Aravasu uh, on guard at um, Yavakri's father's hermitage, does not recognize, uh, ironically does not rec recognize uh, Yavakri's footsteps, stops him, but in the process, uh, the Brahma Rakshas overcomes, uh, overtakes Yavakri and impales him with a spear, killing him on the spot. So Act 1 ends with Yavakri's uh, death. Uh, in Act 2, uh, Brahbhya is horrified to see that his son Paravasu has left the sacrifice just a month before its completion, uh, having heard of his wife uh, Vishakha's uh, sexual misdemeanor. Vishaka meets, uh, uh, talks to Paravasu after many years for the first time and he also meets Aravasu and he gives Aravasu his permission to act in the play. It is here that Paravasu tells uh, Vishaka, right? in fact Vishaka again compares Paravasu to Yavakri and he says that both of you resemble each other because both of you go, go away and uh, whenever you feel like it. Right? So she, she accuses both of them of using her. Right, for their own uh, sensual gratification. Paravasu says, one can practice austerities like a fool, Yavakri, to coerce the gods to bend to one's will, stand in a circle of fire, torture oneself, so many techniques, all equally crass, to make the gods appear. And when they give in, what do you do? Extend the begging bowl, give us reins, cattle, sons, wealth. As though one define human beings by their begging, I despise it. I went because a fire sacrifice is a formal rite. Right? So Paravasu describes the, form, the fire sacrifice as a formal structured rite. It involves no emotional acrobatics from the participants. The process itself will bring Indra to me. And if anything goes wrong, there's nothing the gods can do about it. It has to be set right by a man, by me. That's why, that's why when the moment comes, I shall confront Indra in silence as an equal. For that, it is essential that one shed all human weakness be alone, absolutely on one's own to face that moment, become a diamond, unscratchable, right? So Paravasu's desire is to become absolutely uh, all-powerful, 
and not just use prayers, not just use practices, austerities as a means of gaining access to the gods and favors from them, right? So she, he wants to actually overcome his human weakness and become a god in his own right. So there is no room for emotional attachment in these uh, fire sacrifices, right? It's an absolutely structured, disciplined rite which goes beyond personal uh, obligations uh, of emotions and, and attachment. And Vishaka does not understand this entire, uh, this uh, obsession with absolute power. She says that what's so wrong in being human? What is wrong with, with, living, with leading a human life where uh, one is just happy with, with what one has and with, with, uh, with one's attachments and love for humanity? And she says later on that, uh, that even though Yavakri and you uh, used me and humiliated me for your own lust, uh, at least Yavakri was warm and gentle. Right? For a few minutes, he made me forget the wizened body, the scratchy claws and the, bl and the blood cold as ice and he paid for it with his life. And that's when uh, the Raibhya, uh, her father-in-law appears, and, and Paravasu here deliberately kills his father with an arrow uh, out of his hatred for his father. He kills his father because his father killed Yavakri to disturb him in the last stages of the sacrifice. So he kills his father and he returns to the uh, sacrificial altar. Meanwhile, Aravasu, who has been busy uh, performing the final rites for Yavakri, who has been killed, you know, is late by half an hour for the, uh, the uh, meeting with the uh, tribal elders where he's supposed to marry uh, Nitile. But since he's late, the council of elders have, has left and uh, he is very upset that he has lost his opportunity to actually marry Nitile, who is then promptly married off to another man from her own tribe. And uh, on the way back, he discovers that his father has been killed and Paravasu tells lies to him saying that he mistook their father for a wild animal and shot him with an arrow. But uh, Aravasu uh, now has to perform the rites uh, for, uh, his, for their father, the rites of penitence. And Par Paravasu uh, uh, tells, delegates the, 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 the responsibility of performing these rites of penitence to his brother while he returns immediately to the sacrificial altar. And there later on, uh, the, uh, he meets uh, the Brahmarakshas. Uh, and uh, and Brahmarakshas, the Brahmarakshas who has performed his, uh, his, uh, his role of, uh, his function of killing Yavakri, now seeks to be freed from the bondage of life and death and begs Paravasu to uh, meet the gods, to encounter the gods in his sacrifice and, and request uh, that uh, he be uh, uh, you know, released from, from the bondage of life and rebirth. But uh, Paravasu uh, refuses, he does not know uh, how he can help uh, the Brahmarakshas. And when Aravasu comes to the sacrificial area, after completing the funeral rites, uh, you know, Paravasu uh, falsely accuses, uh, wrongly accuses Aravasu of having killed their father for which the Brahmins uh, refuse to let him come in. They take uh, some, a couple of soldiers take hold of him and drag him away. Act three begins with uh, Aravasu lying in the outskirts of the city with Nitile uh, sleeping next to him. Right? And when he wakes up, he is frightened, uh, not, knowing, not knowing where he is. But he's very happy to see Nitile. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's unable, he's incredulous at the sight of Nitile. And Nitile tells him that uh, she uh, escaped from her husband and uh, to rescue Aravasu. Nitile is also uh, willing to uh, choose Aravasu over her husband and she says, uh, Aravasu, when I say we should be together, I don't mean we should have to live together like lovers or like husband and wife. I have been wishes enough to my husband. I don't want to disgrace him further. Let's be together like brother and sister. You marry any girl you like. Only please Aravasu, spare a corner for me. So she is willing to think outside the fold of marriage to actually probably even continue living with her husband while at the same time having some kind of relationship with Aravasu, even if it is not one of marriage or, uh, or a romantic relationship outside marriage. And Aravasu is determined to actually avenge uh, the, uh, the death of his father. And so he says, uh, he tells Nitale, I can't help it. I want to make, all, make them all pay. Yavakri, father, Paravasu. It's a conspiracy, don't you see? It's all planned because I wanted to marry you, because I was, re I was re re ready to reject my caste, my birth. Can't you see it? I wanted to strike out on my own. So first a corpse curls itself around my ankles, Yavakri. Then its father, bodies drenched in blood. 
like rats that pour out during the plague and die vomiting blood. So he is, con he is convinced, he is determined to actually avenge their, uh, their killings. But Nithile tries to dissuade him from perpetuating the spiraling cycle of violence and bloodshed. And Nithile says, leave that to, to the gods, Aravasu. Look at your family. Yavakri avenges his father Shane by attacking your sister-in-law. Your father avenges her by killing Yavakri. Your brother kills your father. And now you, in your turn, want vengeance. Where will it all end? Aravasu, so what do I do? Sit in a corner with my hands crossed like a eunuch? Nithile, do that. Better, than, better that than become the man you hate. Right? So she tries to convince him to not uh, perpetuate further violence and bloodshed. The actor manager tells Aravasu, any fool can see that you two belong to different worlds. Anything's possible in these troubled times, so I won't comment. But your name's on every tongue in this town and they're mostly trying to spit it out. I didn't save your life, she did. I only found you. You were lucky that she turned up soon after and it's she who has been nursing you, mopping up your vomit, wiping your bottom, like a baby. I'm grateful to her because my babies were starving when she came and now they get a bite to eat every day. When she gets the food from, I, where she gets the food from, I don't know, but she knows the woods. So obviously Nithila is a symbol of compassion. She's someone who is able to access uh, food uh, from the woods, the forest that she knows intimately. We would have moved out of this town the day the old man died, except that we have become dependent on her for food, for nursing, for laughter. We're just waiting to leave with her, but she won't budge till you're better. Uh, then later on, uh, Aravasu decides to actually act in the play and she decides he, he wants to play the role of uh, Vritra, right? And uh, Nithile tells the actor manager that her father and brother and husband will also be there uh, to watch the performance. So they're obviously in search of her and they're willing to do, uh, to take, to do anything to uh, get Nithile back. So she's very, up, she's very scared that maybe her husband might actually end up killing Aravasu right? and, and killing her too. And she doesn't want to die. So the whole act of performing in the play itself is an act of exposure. Uh, to uh, the, tri the tribal community. The actor manager, of course, is only interested in the, in, in the performance happening because that's his only source of income and livelihood. So, so that's the only way that he says, my children will sleep on a full stomach for another two months if this play happens. So uh, when uh, Aravasu decides to play the role of Ritra and not Indra, uh, Nithile says, I'm glad that you're not playing Indra. I don't like that god of yours. He's immortal. When someone doesn't die, can't die, what can he know about anything? He can't change himself. He can't, can't create anything. I like Vritra because even when he is triumphant, he chooses death. I always wonder, if flowers didn't know they were to fade and die, would they ever blossom? Right? So the, again, the contrast between uh, immortality, between immortal gods like Indra, who can never change because they can't die, right? who can't create anything because they can't die. But uh, uh, it's, it's far more glorious, far more uh, joyous to play uh, a human, a mortal character who, 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 can, who can create, who can show compassion for humanity, who can create transformations and change, and who can choose death. Right? They use uh, masks in the play, and Arasu wears the mask of Ritra and the demon, and the actor manager warns him, saying that you should surrender to the mask, but surrender your, and pour your life into it, but remember, once you bring the mask to life, you have to keep a tight control over it. Otherwise, it will try, try to take over, right? It will begin to dictate, dictate terms to you, and you must never let that happen, right? So there's always a risk that if he surrenders to the mask, the mask may actually take over him and acquire a life of its own, which, which is exactly what happens in the play. So in the play, of course, there are these three characters, Indra, Lord Indra, and his brothers, half-brothers, Vritra and Vishwarupa. Vishwarupa is Brahma's son with a human uh, wo uh, mortal woman, and Vritra is uh, Brahma's son with a, de a female demon. And uh, Indra is very uh, insecure about Vishwarupa because Vishwarupa has won the, the praises of everyone for his wisdom and his gentleness. And uh, Indra feels extremely insecure and uh, vulnerable uh, because he seems, he feels like, he feels like an eclipsed moon. Right? He feels like his glory has been eclipsed by, uh, by Vishwarupa. 
and so he wants to kill Vishwarupa and therefore uh, Vritra offers to protect uh, Vishwarupa from Indra. So the two are inseparable uh, because they are, they are always trying to uh, save each other from Indra's wrath. So Indra organizes a fire sacrifice in, in honor of Brahma and he invites all the gods and the men to the sacrifice. And he also invites Vishwarupa to the sacrifice. And but forbids Vritra from coming because he is a Rakshasa, a demon. So, of course, the play itself is a, uh, an allusion to uh, the actual play, the, outs the play outside the play, uh, an allusion to the relationship between Aravasu, Paravasu and their father, Raibya. And ultimately, of course, Indra betrays Vishwarupa and uh, he kills Vishwarupa and Vritra is uh, very upset at his brother's death. And... Um, he enters the enclosure and he sees Vishwarupa is dying and he is furious at Indra's treachery. And they have a, a duel and in the fight, uh, the actor manager is playing Indra and uh, Aravasu is playing Vritra and he completely surrenders to the mask which actually brings Vritra's character to life and the very distinction between fiction and reality is completely uh, collapsed in this moment where he says, you can elude me Indra but you can't escape me. Even if you fly like, like a falcon across 99 rivers, I'll find you. I'll destroy you. I'll raise your befouled sacrifice to the ground. I'll burn down the sacrifice. And that's when uh, Aravasu begins destroying the sacrifice. And the actor manager says, no, no, not that. Stop him. Stop him for God's sake. And Aravasu says, I'm a Brahmin. If you try to stop me, I'll kill myself. And the sin of, uh, and the sin of killing a Brahmin will be on your heads. I'm a Rakshasa. And I'll kill anyone who tries to stop me. And the actor manager is trying very hard to uh, get the mask off uh, um, Aravasu's face, which is what uh, Nitile does. Nitile struggles and she finally manages to remove the mask from Aravasu. And the Brahmins are furious because the entire sacrifice is being desecrated by the tribals and, uh, and Aravasu who has gone to destroy the sacrifice just at the moment of his completion. And Paravasu, who is watching the entire play, realizes that the play is, alluding, is an allusion to him. And he, he tries to stop the destruction by, um, uh, you know, he knocks Aravasu down, he pins him to the ground, and, he, and the husband, uh, Nithila's husband, pulls out a knife, grabs Nithila by her hair, and slashes her throat. Right. Uh, Aravasu gets up, but it's too late to save uh, Nithila who uh, tried to intervene to save him from the fury of the mask that took over. And Indra, Indra's voice can be heard right, in the skies. And he tells, uh, he, he tells Aravasu, do not grieve. We are pleased with you. Ask for any boon and it shall be granted. Right? So Aravasu asks that, uh, that Nithile be brought back to life. So Indra is pleased by the way Aravasu challenged Indra and pursued him in the play. And then he says, uh, that uh, he, he asks him to uh, ask for a boon. And he says, uh, Indra says, it's, not, it's, it's, no, it's no big deal bringing uh, Nithilai back to life. But once the wheel of time starts rolling back, uh, it will bring back everyone to life, all those who have been killed. Paravasu, uh, Yavakri and uh, Nithilai. They will all be brought back to life. And, yeah, and, and uh, Yavakri and, and Aravasu says, yes, let them all be brought back to life. But Indra says that if they're all brought back to life, then they may be a repetition of the same tragedies. And then uh, Aravasu says that may not happen because now having lived this life uh, of, of sacrifice, I have become, I have grown wiser right? and I will not commit the same mistakes again. And uh, Indra is Indra's on the verge of granting him the boon of bringing back Paravasu uh, Yavakri uh, uh, and his father to life when uh, the Brahmarakshas intervenes and begs Aravasu to uh, release him from the bondage of life and death. And uh, uh, Aravasu is on the verge of, of relenting out of his sheer compassion for the Brahmarakshas. But Indra says, there's another consideration that if the wheel of time must roll back, uh, Nithile will return to life, but it must roll forward for the Brahmarakshas to be released from the bondage of life and rebirth. So you can't have it both ways. You can either bring Nithile back to life or you can release the, the Brahma Rakshas from uh, the bondage of life and rebirth. And that's exactly what Aravasu chooses to do. So uh, as the Brahma Rakshas says that you're a human being, you are capable of mercy. So Brahma, the Aravasu actually uh, takes mercy on him and uh, you know, uh, releases him from the uh, cycle of life and death. So therefore, Nithila actually ends up becoming a scapegoat 
to the uh, the rivalries between these different Brahmin men and also Aravasa's own desire to uh, to seek the welfare of his community. And so that's exactly how uh, the uh, the uh, play ends with Nithilai uh, living a life uh, as tormented as as the Brahmarakshas, where uh, you know. Um, uh, the Brahmarakshas is resurrected and uh, released from the cycle of life and, re and rebirth. But Nithile is now living the tormented life of a spirit. And this is exactly uh, how the play um, ends.